the organizers seem to have kept the best uh, for the end. We were speaking about the PCI process, electricity, gas, and now we are coming finally uh, to the real thing, uh, the financing. Uh, which is, you know, I think it was mentioned several times, not that small uh, a detail. But I think we're also coming uh, to, the, to another good thing here. I think this session here has definitely by far the best uh, gender balance of all the panels uh, we had uh, today. So I'm very grateful uh, for this. Um, now, my name is, as you see, Christian Egenhofer. I'm heading the SEPS Energy and Climate Change uh, Program. Uh, and uh, we are working in my team of 14 people, a number of issues, energy prices, market design, competitiveness, but also finance and infrastructure, some of you, our work, uh, you may have uh, seen. The organizers have uh, asked us to focus very much, quite uh, logically, on transmission and storage. And as you see from the program, you see the, the question they have uh, brought up. What are the challenges in grid financing from the investors' perspectives? They are here. You know, how could we attract a sufficient um, equity and debt? And I think there's an important distinction to be made here. Uh, and the, the vehicles or the instruments. And then there was a direct question, I guess, to Alberto Potocnik. You know, what is the role of, of Acer? And I'm sure he will uh, address that uh, later. So, but I would uh, also add on, and we, I think it's, it's important, you know, what would be the role of the, the public sector in mobilizing uh, finance, uh, if any? Uh, and the EU budget, you know, we haven't really mentioned it. Uh, does it uh, play a role? Yes, of course, it, it has. Uh, been, been hinted that there are mechanisms, but there is interplays between these different uh, in, instruments. Now, finally, as it was mentioned a number of times, yes, we are focused here on, on, on transmission and storage, but let's not forget about uh, the smartness, the smart infrastructure, smart grids, smart cities, and these kind of things, the DSOs aspects as well, which brings, of course, demand response into the game, and that I think from the finance perspective, uh, you know, might be an important uh, part. It is my pleasure now to welcome and to quickly introduce uh, this uh, very distinguished uh, list uh, of speakers. Uh, here, as in the program, Cheryl Fisher uh, from the European Investment Bank, she's a director of energy uh, department, Alberto Potocnik, uh, director of Acer, Guillaume Rivron, who is a Magritte Fund uh, investment, it's here, <laughs> investment director, and she's just, uh, he's, uh, you know, from the Macquarie uh, Infrastructure and, you know, and Real Assets uh, Limited. Now, I thought to make most out of this session, I suggest to start with Jiri, uh, uh, to give an investor's perspective, but also I've asked him to be as provocative as possible, you know, to trigger comments by the others to give a bit of homework to our uh, other speakers. And then we asked Cheryl, uh, Guillaume, and then Alberto uh, to, you know, to give answers uh, to what you are uh, wanting to say. I should also add that uh, Cheryl, unfortunately, will have to, uh, you know, leave us 10 minutes before, so we are matching the old uh, sort of gender balance uh, uh, structure. She has to get on to the, to the shuttle uh, to, 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 to the airport, and I think this is a, you know, is a respectable uh, request, which we are happy uh, to comply with. Now, I asked all the speakers to speak for about uh, five minutes, then we have some discussion among ourselves. Jiri might have seven minutes you know, provided he really is provocative enough. You know, if not, you know, we cut it uh, to five minutes, you know. So please, over to you. I'll do my best. Right, so, uh, good afternoon. I'll try to sort of uh, keep this session interesting. So why do you have an investment banker standing in front of you talking about infrastructure? There's a very simple reason we are providers of capital to realize your dreams and vision. Uh, call us uh, CapEx facility providers. And that is both in terms of new infrastructure as well as financing uh, existing infrastructure, therefore releasing capital from existing infrastructure that will allow you to uh, realize other investments uh, that would improve your grids, uh, improve your gas pipelines, 
or do other types of investment uh, in energy generation area or, or storage? I'll try to ask, answer three questions. Number one is, uh, what's the role of financial sponsors in providing private capital? Second question is, uh, what do we require? So what are we interested in? And then hopefully uh, trying to answer a question, what are the consequences for energy and gas in that context? There's a beautiful slide. You can definitely read every single line on it. I'm absolutely sure of it. This is portfolio of our investments uh, across the world. Uh, there's about 101 investments globally. About 20 of them are in the energy sector. So but don't worry, I'll not bother you with the detail. I'll skip this, go straight into uh, attracting investment into European infrastructure. Europe is working in the context of global competitiveness for attracting capital. And further on, within Europe, each country is competing for attracting capital. And within each country, every region is competing for attracting capital. There is no homogenous view. For us, there is no one Europe. There is always a specific opportunity, which we will assess with a critical assessment of all individual fundamental elements of that opportunity. We are not investors into strategies. We will never invest into gas strategy or into power strategy. We will always assess every single opportunity year on year on its own merit, on its own circumstance. And actually, there are several elements which are driving our decision making in the process. There's a challenge here on the slide. The challenge says there's an enormous amount of capital required to be deployed into private infrastructure. And that capital cannot be provided from public. It has to be provided from private sources as well. If you look on uh, what is important for us, why do we are uh, attracted to this? And that is uh, uh, the attraction comes from uh, size. We like chunky investments. Uh, as I said, there are guys like Marguerite who would prefer to go into the greenfield. We actually like more the brownfield. So we like things that are already standing and are already in place, are in the ground. Uh, are well regulated. There's a clear stability around political setup, which is long term. There is adequate risk and reward. There are transparent rules around operating these assets from operational point of view, health and safety point of view, union management and workforce point of view. And there is a very transparent regulation. And here I'm hinting on a situation where there are several examples recently over the past two, three years, like Spain, like Hungary, and to some extent Czech Republic, which are simply not giving the signs of stability for foreign investors. If we look at harmonization of regulatory framework across Europe, we applaud the process and clearly unbundling provides opportunities for someone like us, for more private capital to come to opportunities like yourselves. Uh, Macquarie itself, we manage 78 billion euros of capital from about 450 investors, which are all private pension funds or government money, mostly outside of Europe. And they all want to invest in Europe. But they will only be attracted to investments which make sense, sense in terms of risk and return. What is the second key element of uh, consideration is that generally investors like ourselves are more interested in regulated revenue streams, less so in uh, businesses which are running the risk of commodity or volume uh, driven exposure to revenue and profitability. If you look at uh, what an attractive investment should look like, and uh, it is clearly, I think, one underlining theme for everything. Everything comes down to cash flow. We financial investors, we like cash flows. For some, we are obsessed with, with cash flows. We, we, we think they are sort of a, a measure of comparing and comparable. Every single investment is, is different, but there is always one thing which uh, we think can uh, express the value of that investment, and that is free cash flow for some obsessive reason. And we try to take a view on how risky or how not risky that is. And it's a long-term projection that we are interested in. The way we look at that is we look at adequate return based on long-term forecast. In Germany, we will probably look at something like 10% to be adequate for us. If you look at uh, Central Eastern Europe, that is going to go north from that 10%. And uh, when you look at that, uh, obviously, we would like to get uh, uh, ability to deploy and service debt. We would like to manage effective configuration of assets because that is a very important ability of optimizing the capital structure. And, and we think we can do it pretty well. 
uh, there is strong focus on yield because our pension investors, which actually in many circumstances managing your own pensions, uh, are looking for return because they need to pay their pensions annually and obviously they are looking for stable returns in terms of yield. And obviously we consider regulatory risk. As I said already, commodity risk is not what we like. So in conclusion, there's plenty of private capital available for investments in energy, whether it's gas, electricity, whether it is transmission, distribution, storage, or NL, uh, LNG. They are clearly distinctive groups. Brownfield regulated infrastructure is going to attract investors like ourselves. And our pool of capital that we have available as an industry, not as Macquarie, but as an industry, as financial sponsors and financial managers, is great. Uh, these are trillions of euros of capital available for infrastructure. However, please do not be fooled by that because obviously there is a lot of competition. You are competing with other asset classes. You're competing with roads. You're competing with uh, airports. Uh, you're competing with uh, communication infrastructure. And most of all, you're competing geographically. And Europe is only going to get attracted, uh, or it's going to get attractive for capital if it's stable, predictable, and if it delivers on the promise of that perceived stability. If it is unstable, and I clearly must say that uh, if you look at development of utilities, in particular in Europe, and the changes that utility, cha the, the development of green energy support actually had on volatility of utility shares actually in Europe, that has not certainly brought much more stability. Uh, to the sector. It actually brought instability. That's why utilities have to dispose of assets such as TSO. Good example was the OGE uh, acquisition which we made uh, last year by E.ON. So those are all the elements that I wanted to highlight and uh, hopefully I answered the three questions, the role of the sponsors and uh, what do we require and uh, what are the challenges. Okay, uh, thank you. you. You answered them. Uh, judging from the applause, you answered them uh, well. The very number of points, uh, volatility of utility uh, sectors, is, looks, I look to the regulators, but also this question about uh, unbundling and transparency. There were some other noises before in the room. Maybe we, we, we picked it up. Uh, Cheryl, it's uh, now you are next uh, to you know, address the issues we've been given or respond to any of the points Jiri made. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I think I'm going to start with the good news, and, and the good news is to echo what uh, Yuri, sorry, if I yes. pronounce your name yes. correctly, has already said, is that um, there is a lot of capital available to finance good projects in Europe. Um, the EIB, where I'm a director, so the European Investment Bank, we're already a major funder of um, transmission and distribution projects in the gas and electricity sector throughout Europe. 19 billion in the electricity sector since 2007, which is supporting 38 billion worth of projects, 10 billion in gas, 20 billion worth of projects. So for investors like us, what we're looking for are good projects. Now, of course, that's, um, you'll all come and say you've got great projects. So I'll now come on to what does that good project look like and what, is it, what are the characteristics of good projects? What are lenders looking for? Um, but before I go there, just some other good news is that we recently concluded our energy review. We've recently done a, a major review of what investments are going to be needed in Europe across the whole of the energy sector, so both in generation as well as in the networks and, and covering everything from nuclear to renewable energy. And it comes as no surprise to this audience that the investments in the network sector are clearly a high priority. Um, I think both um, the speaker from NSOE as well as Martin Lingard both spoke about the fact that we're at a really important moment in the development of our electricity and gas networks. We have a major uh, rehabilitation of the networks to do, and we also need to incorporate the renewable energy that we put on the system, and we need to do this um, in a coordinated and integrated fashion. So investing in our um, energy networks is a uh, high priority for Europe, and it's a high priority, therefore, for EIB. Because unlike Macquarie, EIB is a lender that's both interested in the credit, we, we lend money, we need to get our money back. We, we don't receive subventions, if you like, direct from the community budget, so we raise money in the capital markets and we lend it out to clients. But also, we need to make sure that the projects are good projects, so they're economically justified. So there's been a lot of discussion today about cost-benefit analysis, and in fact, one of the things that the EIB already does is every project we finance, 
we have to ensure is economically justified. So we do an e economic analysis on every project. Um, looking at what, what opportunities there are for people who have good projects, what sort of finance can you get? Obviously, there is long-term debt, and that's the bedrock of what we do. We do a lot of long-term debt. We also do equity through funds, so we invest in funds like um, Marguerite, and uh, Guillaume will speak later about Marguerite's investments. Um, but we also help to develop projects, and I think that um, I, I, I'll keep coming back to the fact that having a good project which has a good structure is the important part of having a bankable project, a project that people like us will fund. And we have Jaspers, who works with um, member states to actually bring forward projects and to have them structured in a way which can be financed either through debt or potentially through project bonds. And that's potentially the third element that the EIB is looking at. We can both help you develop good projects, but also we're working with the Commission to try and leverage Commission funds to bring in alternative investors um, into the sector, rather than just banks like EIB and commercial funders, how do we leverage in more long-term lenders, such as pension funds, such as insurance companies? Because the challenge, actually, for, as I see it, for this sector is, is partly the tenor. When, when I talk about tenor, sorry, the, 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 the maturity of your assets, the assets that we're building here last for 30, 40 years. Um, commercial bank debt is going to provide you with a debt of, say, five to 10 years. So either that means you're going to pay more more for your assets because you have to repay that debt over a 10-year period, or you have a risk of refinancing that debt. So your corporate borrowers have to actually take a 10-year loan and then have to take the risk that they can find another 10-year loan af after that 10-year loan is um, matured. So actually extending the length of your debt, actually, the, 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 the period over which your debt is repaid, is quite an important part of reducing the cost to final consumers. And how can you extend the debt? It's actually by bringing institutional investors in, like Macquarie, who themselves manage funds for pension funds and for insurance companies, to actually lengthen the tenor of your debt. Um, now, of course, if you're going to do that, though, then it comes down to the nuts and bolts of how do you attract those investors? And I'm afraid it is, it's really simple. You're, you're all very intelligent engineers. Actually, banking is much simpler than engineering. It really is just about uh, we need to make sure the borrower can repay his loan. And repaying your loan is simply a matter of looking at the revenues he generates and the costs he incurs. And therefore, when we're looking at the sort of assets you're talking about, the, the transmission assets and the, the, um, in the gas and the electricity sector, investors will look at those as a single asset. You don't have a, we don't have diversified corporate borrowers when we're looking at a transmission system operator or a distribution system operator. We have a, basically a borrower who has a single asset type. And therefore, the regulatory system is just of fundamental importance to the ability of that company to repay its debt, because there is not a, a, a free market for transmission assets. It's a regulated market, for good reasons, because it's a monopoly, a monopoly asset. So the quality of the, of the regulation and the, the robustness of that is, is really important. F from a lender's point of view, um, Obviously, track record is very important, so the more history you have around your regulatory system, the better. But if you don't have a lot of history, having a very strong legal basis for your regulatory framework will help you. So that actually, people aren't, the investors are not so much at risk of changes to prices which are driven by political considerations, but they're, they're actually fundamentally pinned into the, the legal framework in the country. Obviously, we've had a lot... I'm going to stop soon. Sorry, there's lots to talk about. But actually, I just want to come back to the question of affordability as well, because undoubtedly um, having electricity systems, and systems which are affordable is a sine qua non. If, if people can't pay for electricity, there's no point in having electricity systems. So we need to make sure, and gas, we have to make sure that those systems are affordable. Um, and again, for an investor, if you want to attract investors to your projects, the more that the investors can see that the government has gone through a process of ensuring that not only th they've picked the best investments, but also that those investments are affordable, that they have done long-term projections, they've looked at downsides, they, they can see how these investments will be paid for in a variety of scenarios, will actually provide confidence to investors in a way that actually is quite difficult if, if it's just a politically driven motivation. So um, having intelligent dialogues with both your consumers as well as your funders will help to ensure that actually you can attract good investment into your, and, and volumes of investment into your networks. Actually, there's lots more to say, but I'll stop there. Okay. Um.
Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. You will have a possibility to continue uh, these discussions uh, later when we had all our initial uh, remarks. Um, we come uh, now to the next uh, Guillaume Rivron Marguerite Fund. It has already been mentioned. I think you some of what take some of the points further that have been discussed here. So please. Sure. Thanks, Christian. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, may maybe in a nutshell, um, um, just to, 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 um, to, to express who, who we are. Uh, so basically, we are, we are investing across Europe, uh, EU28 now. Um, and as uh, Yuri said, uh, mostly in greenfield assets. Uh, we have to add new capacity. It can also be existing assets which need uh, some additional capex. But capex is uh, the main thing for us. And, um, and we do invest uh, in transport, uh, conventional energy, and, uh, and, and renewable. Um, we've invested already uh, 300 million, and we've got 400 million uh, euro to invest uh, in the next uh, three years. So obviously, we welcome uh, the PCI initiative, uh, which uh, hopefully is, uh, is targeting in, uh, in, in that specific angle of uh, transmission, uh, gas or electricity, the, the, the right project. And as Sherrod was saying, I mean, a, a right project from our perspective um, it is a project which has economic sense. So we'll spend quite a bit of time, given that we're Greenfield Fund and that we, we're taking the construction risk, to make sure that basically, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the construction will be managed appropriately and, and also that the business case uh, for the long term of the assets is strong. Um, challenge and opportunities, um, I, 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 I won't repeat uh, what has been mentioned already. Um, just maybe a, an additional point, because there's a new feature of the PCI, which are cross-border transaction. And when you speak about cross-border, um, you have to agree uh, between the, the TSOs on the regime which will be applicable to the, uh, to the assets. Uh, that's not always very clear. Um, so there's a little bit of, uh, of initial work to be done. But, um, but uh, hopefully the, the coordination and the dialogue, which has been mentioned uh, all over the conference, uh, will actually happen between the the different countries and TSOs, so that there, there will be a strong case for the project and there will be a surprise once the investment has been made, because we clearly don't like uh, uh, retroactive measures uh, once we've invested. Um, to attract equity, uh, obviously the, the regulation is very important, uh, stability, predictability, uh, this is clear. Uh, the, the other element, at least in our case, because we look at the asset, we, we typically don't invest into the uh, holding company is really to make sure that we've got a ring-fenced asset where all the risks have been clearly identified and therefore we can manage them appropriately. And also, uh, we need a minimum return. Um, uh, you know, the, what we've seen in the past uh, uh, in, 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 some, in some of the uh, uh, countries where we looked uh, at investment is that maybe uh, the regulation was not encouraging uh, uh, new investment, or at least dissociating new investment in terms of the, the, the return which those investment could earn. So uh, we would very much welcome, um, um, uh, you know, return requirements which, which will take into account, factor in the, the construction risk, so that there is a differentiation between investing into an existing asset, which is already fully built, and, and a new one. Um, so that's a kind message for the, for the regulators. Um, the, the, the other one also is that we, we would also very much welcome um, ad hoc companies uh, for those new investments. That's far easier from this perspective if you, if you consider an SPV and you can really specifically invest into that SPV. I think that brings benefit to, uh, to the community overall, to all the stakeholders, because you can clearly identify this specific asset and run that asset more effectively and have much more uh, transparency over its management, and that's certainly better for, from the investor perspective because then it's not mixed with the other asset that the, uh, the TSO might have. And, uh, and also the, the other thing is that hopefully in terms of framework, and there's been a lot of work done by the Commission from that perspective, you still have a bit of uh, flexibility. You know, you could uh, invest into a fully unbundled TSO or an ITO. I mean, th th there is option, and financial investors uh, can really also on their side focus on that asset and, and not uh, try to, uh, to mingle with, uh, with the generation or the distribution. It can really be uh, managed by itself. Uh, lastly, uh, on, on the role of regulator, uh, I very much hope that um, uh, this new initiative uh, will enable um, the project have been detected already, uh, but uh, every two years I understand there will be reassessment, so I think it's, it's very good to steer uh, the process going forward, and that's a new benefit when compared with the old 10-year uh, structure. 
Uh, on the permitting, I'm also looking forward to it. Uh, this is clearly uh, for those looking at uh, greenfield investment, many times a, a, big, uh, a big issue. Uh, I would also very much welcome the ability, especially in the electricity sector, for financial investors to be able to invest alongside uh, state-owned TSOs. There are many of them, much more in the electricity sector than in the gas sector. And many times the reply we have when we say we would be very keen to co-invest alongside you is you just can't. So yes, there is a, a gap. Uh, yes, there is availability of, uh, of equity uh, to, um, to, to, to co-invest beyond the debt. But um, it's important to, to, to make the framework available so that that equity, private equity, can effectively uh, you know, be part of those investments and therefore be allowed um, to, to, to be a, a shareholder in some of those TSOs where currently it's not possible. Um, and the last point, uh, hopefully, and we've talked about it earlier uh, today, uh, as those deals are covering several countries, I think it's important long term to harmonize the frameworks. So that you know, the system which is used in one country we, will actually be compatible with the system used in the other one, because in those cross-border um, transaction, uh, transmission link or, uh, or, or gas system, sometimes it's a little bit uncertain. Uh, and, and the peers at which, for instance, the TSOs are uh, revising the regulation and the outcome of those revisions are not necessarily consistent. So clearly, consistency uh, is, is also important to us. OK, uh, uh, consistency, I think we will we'll certainly come back uh, to this. Now, we're coming to our last intervention uh, by Alberto Potocnik, who, as a regulator, is used to have the last word. So please, <laughs> well, uh, you have the last Not at ASA, anyway. Um, <laughs> well, thank you very much. I would like to thank the Lithuanian presidency for this opportunity. I feel a bit out of depth in here. I mean, there, um, among all. Um, very experienced um, colleagues from the financial sector, and I don't know much about finance. What I've heard and what I take from their presentation is that money is available and can go to the energy infrastructure sector if the conditions are right. Uh, now, in the past, um, energy infrastructure was developed mainly um, through tariffs, uh, the regulated system and tariffs, and consumers were paying. Um, we were in a system where, in most cases, we had vertically integrated businesses, and therefore the financial strength of a vertically integrated company was different from what I hear now is the financial strength and of um, uh, unbundled um, TSOs. So there may be the need to have additional funds coming in. We've heard today uh, about the unattractive terms uh, on which debt is available to some of the um, uh, energy companies, um, equity injections. Um, so there may be opportunities now for this marriage of convenience between, or more opportunities from this marriage of convenience. Um, I had the privilege of receiving the presentation a few days ago um, as part of this panel, and I went through the 110, 101 <laughs> project, and I have to say that, you know, uh, there is a lot of infrastructure there, obviously, but I've counted probably five or six of what I would consider as being transmission projects, many more in terms of uh, uh, renewable uh, generation projects. Now, I think here we have to be clear. I mean, that reg regulated uh, projects um, can mean two things. Can mean renewables, because they're regulated in terms of usually being supported by incentives, and sort of transmission project transmission assets which are regulated, sometimes in, you know, through incentive-based regulation, but they are not likely to receive the same return as um, renewables received in the past in some jurisdictions, to the extent that some jurisdictions had to retroactively change their minds, so as to speak, and that's the, some of the bad examples of, um, that were questioned. So I think you know, what we're talking here is not the uh, highly attractive terms on which um, renewables have been supported in some jurisdictions so far. And I think going forward, the system in Europe, in Europe cannot afford to maintain this kind of um, promotion um, uh, schemes and probably will have to focus more on those assets of those technologies which are not mature yet and more and more technology will become mature and th therefore will be left to 
to, to sort of to compete in the market by themselves. So, but let's 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 focus now on the on on the on the, trans, on the sort of more traditional transmission business, where there is we've seen this morning uh, there is a, um, a, a, a a large requirement for for investment more than has there has been in the past. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you know a regulated business is preferred because regulation gives stability um, under certain conditions. But I've also noticed you know that the return has to be appropriate and the risk has to be sort of uh, manageable. Um, unbundling is important. Now, um, what I was sort of wondering is whether you know, financial operators are not looking at the sense that competition between regulatory regimes to see which one provides the most stable environment for investment, which would be an interesting way of using competition um, sort of to try to um, improve uh, social welfare. I mean, to me, clearly, one welfare loss, net welfare loss, is where there is regulatory risk, because regulatory risk does not benefit anyone. I mean, you can have higher return, lower return. You know, higher return, the, the banks or the financial sector gets more, and then somebody will get this money eventually. Lower return, the reverse. But where we are really wasting um, our money is uh, with uh, regulatory risk, because also it's very difficult to hedge. So this is where I say this, because this is where the agency tries to come in. Um, there is still a lot of different practices in Europe. I mean, I have to say, we still have, we have not yet common best practices. In fact, we are still trying to identify what best practices are. Uh, but as part of the uh, new regulation and guidelines on trans-European energy infrastructure, the agency is tasked with collecting practices around Europe and try to identify best practices. We've just done the first step i.e. we received over the summer, uh, what national regulators uh, believe are their practices in dealing with um, investment uh, uh, regulation, especially with respect to special risks and how to provide incentives uh, to um, project promoters in general, sort of TSOs and, and other investors. And now, over the next few months, we were supposed to do this by the end of the year, but I think we will probably um, provide this uh, beginning of next year is basically, um, you know, a definition of what we consider um, among the regulators in Europe as being best practices, so that we can have a blueprint of to try to reduce um, regulatory risk and try to provide that stable regulatory framework that seems to be a precondition both for equity and, and, and debt. Um, then it would be up to national regulators, but. There, I think we can count of regulatory competition or competition between, for funds between different jurisdictions to, um, to try to make sure that um, this best practice is once identified. And I don't believe that we will say you have to do this, but we will clearly identify practices which are not best practices. And then a range of um, sort of instruments that can be sort of mixed up to, 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 convert, to, to, to come up with, with, a with a reasonable practice. So, uh, so that's what we're trying to do. Um, we are also in a, co in a more complex world because now we have more and more cross-border projects. But again, the, this package, the latest regulation, has ways of allocating costs between different jurisdictions to make sure that these, uh, first of all, to provide a, a fairer way of sharing costs, but also to make sure that this uh, project uh, proceeds. Um, if if, um, if projects have a positive cost-benefit analysis at European level, there must be an allocation of costs that delivers positive benef net benefits also at each jurisdiction level. Then here you have two issues, again coming back to what this panel is about. One could be affordability and one could be financing. Affordability, mean, what I mean by affordability is some of the benefits which are taken into account in the cost-benefit analysis are not affordable are not valued to the extent of becoming affordable in some jurisdictions. Some of these benefits may not be immediate. Some of these benefits may not be easily privatized or privatizable. And therefore, um, you know, th there may be difficulty in individual jurisdictions to pay for these benefits. And that's where I think the sort of um, European funds may come in. Financing, well, 
I think if the value of the project is there, there, mu there must be instruments, and I would be interested in, in, in hearing from my colleagues, what could be the business model or the model to make sure that these projects, which have a positive return, so they have, you know, they, they, they are economically viable, um, can, can be financed properly. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. I don't think this was uh, the last word. I think rather the beginning of, an, of some debate we are going uh, to have here on, on this panel. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's nice, and I, perhaps some of you can answer. You know, are you really interested only in renewables, which have, of course, a high rate of return, or in the future? I think we should add nuclear to it after the, the British decision, although we don't know uh, where this will end up. Uh, or is there really a case uh, for infrastructure, which is the, the theme, uh, which is the theme we are discussing here? Uh, now, there was the other point uh, about uh, the regulatory risk, but also are you looking at the, the, the competition of a regulatory system? I think very interesting points you, you might want. I mean, all of you may uh, want to look at. Uh, and then, uh, again, uh, you know, stability. Our old world, you know, integrated, vertically integrated utilities was rather stable. This is a bit uh, less stable. So where is, is the tension and then the business model and the affordability? Lots of points here. I don't know whether you may want to make a few uh, comments on, on the other challenges uh, they put. And then I think we give the floor to Cyril, who has to leave. Uh, in about uh, 10 minutes, and then we continue uh, among ourselves. But also, please prepare already now the questions that will be coming after this round. Okay, trying to answer first question. Uh, yes, main focus is on infrastructure. Our latest two investments uh, were uh, one was transmission network, in which we invested 3.2 billion euros, and the other one was uh, gas DSO, uh, distribution network in Czech Republic. Uh, where we consolidated minority stakes with RWE. And if I look at the pipeline of new opportunities, they will be primarily either energy or electricity, uh, TSOs or distribution networks or gas distribution networks. So definitely renewable energy is actually a uh, uh, bit of a sort of bit of an issue because of uh, instability of tariff. Uh, however, you made one very important point, which I would like to contradict if I can. There is enormous cross-impact across various regulators, not only within the individual subsectors of energy uh, between uh, renewables and TSO, but the perceived instability of regulator can actually come even from completely different part of regulation, such as telco reg regulator in a country being politically influenced in, in one way related, for example, to an auction of an LTE spectrum. And then that perceived instability having impact on, okay, how will the energy regulator be independent? And uh, the political framework is very, very important, and we shouldn't underestimate the cross impact across different uh, parts of regulation and legislative framework. But in hindsight, as I said, uh, yes, infrastructure is much more important uh, in terms of our focus today, and uh, these are the impacts that it creates. Uh, thank you. Gerald, there were a few points uh, also uh, to you, uh, certainly affordability and all this cost benefit. Now, I have a question as well. The PCIs, of course, are there because they have a positive cost benefit analysis. You know, what is in your analysis different uh, what they are uh, doing, or how do you take them further? Um, I think that fundamentally the approach uh, that the um, the, the, has been used to choose the economically justified PCIs is fundamentally the same as the approach we would use. And in fact, we're discussing with both uh, the Commission as well as uh, ENSO, ENI, ENSO, G, that the, the approach that we use to, to look at uh, benefits. Um, so I think that hopefully that they'll be the same, but inevitably there might be some projects we've already heard about competing projects. Um, obviously, the economics of one project may damage the economics of another project. So by definition, you, you can't necessarily have two projects both being economically justified, which are both serving similar needs. So de definitely there will always be some um, grey areas uh, at, the, at the margins. But generally, I would expect the CBAs to give, give similar results. Uh, just coming back to the renewable energy or infra um, lending, um, 
I mean, obviously, EIB is driven by policy objectives, so we're not necessarily driven by returns. But I think as a more general comment, uh, and it echoes, I think, what Yuri says, which is that th there are different pockets of money out there. There are different people who are looking for dis different risk return um, uh, trade-offs. So there is a, a large pool of capital that's looking for low risk um, and will accept a lower return. And there's another pool of capital which is looking for higher risk. And wants, because it wants a higher return. So investors are, are quite sophisticated in terms of looking at risk return, and, and some investors will take higher risks, but what investors can't take is event risk. What they can't take is the risk that they lose all of their money because of a regulatory change or, have, or face a substantial loss. And that's why I think all of us here has emphasised the regulatory risk, because it's one of those on or off, it's a binary risk, which is too difficult to mitigate or control within your financing structures. So. Okay, thank you. That, thank you for these uh, clarifications and uh, also your, your uh, points. Uh, Guillaume, you want to take up some of the points that have been made? Uh, maybe also, um, because sometimes I, I hear from, from TSOs, uh, financial investors, uh, you know, what, what, what's, what's the point? I mean, what can they bring to the party? Um, I, I think that we're we here at the end of the day to um, um, to, to, to invest in, uh, in projects which, as you assess those projects yourselves, have to make sense. And, uh, and we are basically here to contribute, um, either to, uh, to basically structure, I mean, help you structure those projects and, 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 and raise um, debt, because we, we can provide equity, but uh, you will still have to, to get some debt. And sometimes it's not obvious uh, the way um, to structure debt um, is, is, is a long process. Um, and, and also during the operations, as we focus on the money we've spent, we've invested on those specific assets, we will want to make sure that, that basically every year uh, the, uh, the, the, the operations of those assets are, are really um, you know, done in a focused way, which I think helps vis-a-vis uh, -vis putting the pot of money into the company overall. I mean, here there's a specific objective, and, 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 and I, I believe that we, we, we help um, the, 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 the operating uh, TSO to really um, deliver uh, the business which has specifically been identified uh, for, for those assets. So th there is value at different parts of the cycle. And, and, and clearly for greenfield funds like us, uh, the value starts uh, before uh, you, 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 you close basically your, your financing by attracting the debt in the form of uh, long-term debt or in the form of product bond or what have you. The, clearly there are lots of different pockets here. Uh, Alberto, you raised a few points. Uh, did you get uh, answers, sufficient answers to, to your points, or you have others uh, to make? Well, I don't think we can pretend, or I can't, could have pretended, of sorting out all the issues <laughs> in 10 minutes. Um, no, I think I got, I mean, um, well, I got some of the answers. I think um, more work, and this is why I think also the bank is actually working at the moment in trying to find models and instruments for getting this money into the, into the sector. Uh, now, I just wanted to comment on, on, on one aspect, because regulatory risk has been, again, stressed as being the, 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 the potential problem, and I agree that it's probably that risk which is most difficult to hedge. Um, now, regulators in, I would say, all jurisdictions have, among their objectives, the long-term viability of the business. So it is not in the interest of regulators to push any undertaking, and let alone the transmission um, operator out of business. I mean, that's a nightmare for any regulator. So, it's, it's, so regulators are on the same side, I would say, as, as, um, as everybody else. Would, yeah. Consumers have no incentives of running, you know, of pushing TSO out of business. I think those who are financing the business don't have any incentive. So it's a matter of finding, you know, the right, um, the right combination of risk and return. Uh, as already meant, um, I mentioned, you know, high risk, sorry, low risk and high return. I don't think will be available in the future anymore. But I, 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 the right combination. Now, what I hear from my colleagues in national regulators is that the independence of national regulators, which it has to do with stability, because as I said, regulators, as their statutory objective, have also the long-term, and this is the important part, the long-term viability of the business. Uh, there are increasing worries in, in a number of jurisdictions about the actual independence of, of regulators, and this is something 
from the administration, from the political interference. This is something that was introduced from the, in, in, in the third package. Beforehand, it was the independence from the industry, which is pretty obvious, but then you know, it, it became obvious, ob similarly obvious that you also want the independence. And this is an area where I think we still have to uh, pay attention because it's, I think it's fundamental. I mean, there is no point in trying to identify good regulatory practices if then you have these practices interfered by the short-term political objectives of the government of the time. Um, so this is not for the agency, that's probably, but it's, it's, it's tricky because at the end of the day, you know, the regulator has to be accountable and accountability and independence are separated by a very thin line. So, um, but this is an area where, you know, I think more attention needs to be paid and this is recurrent you know, the, uh, every, every so many years, you know, um, sometimes politicians and government realize that a, a too much of an independent, independent regulator may be a problem. So, um, so I think, you know, the agenda for the future is to work on instruments, but apparently my colleagues are doing that, and some of them are already into the business, so I'm sort of quite happy the way in which it goes. Uh, and the rest uh, of us works on regulatory stability. No. <laughs> okay, now there, we have some time uh, for questions. Uh, Cheryl would be able to take one more, one question. So if you wanted to have something from and on the European Investment Bank, uh, that is uh, the moment. But, you know, if there are other questions, please uh, feel free to step up. We would take three at the same time, and if you could identify yourself and also say to whom it is addressed, that would greatly help. Uh, and please keep yourself as concise as possible. Please, there was one. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Linus Belsis, member of Lithuanian Parliament and uh, working in the Energy Commission, um, among the other duties. Uh, I understand Cheryl is leaving, uh, so a uh, very brief question. Cheryl, you mentioned uh, that uh, European Investment Bank is keen on investing in the nuclear. So, would you please, uh, uh, would you please tell us uh, in uh, how many nuclear power stations have you invested uh, in already, and at which extent? It's a very brief question, and why you did that. Uh, and my another question is goes to Alberto uh, Potocnik. Uh, in your presentation, I noticed that you said that renewables are subsidized. That's a fact, but you didn't, didn't say anything about uh, that the fossil fuel is subsidized. So my question is why you didn't say that, because the open sources tell the DG Energy and uh, the OSCD uh, information sources that uh, renewables are subsidized in Europe 30 billion a year. Re uh, fossil fuel the same, 30 billion a year of direct subsidies plus 40, 40 billion euros a year of indirect subsidies in social care and Medicare. So don't you think of the regulators organization that uh, if fossil fuel is so good and, 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 and fine and competitive, why don't we take off the subsidies from, from it and, and save taxpayers money? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think this was about regulatory risk as well. Uh, there was here one, another one. Um. <laughs> I, I really don't want to take the floor, but I just want to challenge that last point. Those so-called $30 billion of subsidies on fossil fuels are completely fictional because they represent the differential between taxation on gas oil and taxation on petrol for the most part if you look at the OECD work. So they, there isn't a question to answer there. Okay, so we're still looking for a question to Cheryl, which takes some time. So please, anybody else? Okay. Yeah, okay. No, that. I mean, just very briefly, uh, I think I don't think I actually said uh, EIB is very keen to invest in nuclear. What I was describing was the fact that we had just completed our energy review, which covered all the sectors across the whole energy sector from nuclear to renewable. I also don't think I made a comment on subsidies either. Um, so, in fact, we, we've, what I was explaining is we've just done a very wide ranging review of EIB's um, investments in the energy sector. And actually, we have concluded, as you probably well know, with that, with the priorities, which will, are actually around renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy networks, which are the three priorities of EIB lending. But the bank does also continue to support competitive and secure energy supplies in terms of, and that involves sometimes investments in gas networks, as well as some investments in other sectors, which are consistent with EU energy and climate policies. So that's all set out in our, in our energy review. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now she really has to leave now. Uh, we otherwise. Uh, uh, our colleagues from the organizing committees will uh, complain, rightly so. So, but we still have, a, you know, if the organizers allow us to, to take some more uh, questions. Excuse me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is there, there is no more question, so, so be it. Uh, now. You wanted to, to just, comment on some just, of these just, points no, as well. I just need to clarify why I only refer to renewables. It was just looking at the famous 101 <laughs> projects where I found, and it was not, I didn't want to enter into the debate of who is subsidized, who is not subsidized. I mean, I, I was not taking the point from that angle. I was just, um, you know, bumping into a lot of solar and wind farms in this list. And so I was, and, and you know, th that was my question whether, and, and I think we all know that in some jurisdictions these kind of projects were incentivized to an extent that led to these schemes to be sometime abruptly interrupted uh, because they were, they were probably too generous or more generous than intended. And I, th that was, you know, th th that was the purpose of my remark saying, you know, I've noticed a fair amount of renewable projects here. I just wanted to hear what I've heard, that in fact, you know, uh, funds are actually looking with interest also at infrastructure projects we do not have, which do not have the same combination of risk and return as some of the renewables project under support schemes in various jurisdictions. So I'm I didn't want to compare renewables with other forms of generation. I wanted to compare you know, a few of the projects in these 101 um, projects and, um, and, and to ask my question, for which I got a very satisfactory answer. Thank you. Um, now, if there are no uh, further questions, uh, Yuri, maybe uh, I would like uh, to use the opportunity. Uh, as already Alberto said, the, the system of renewables subsidies were perhaps a little bit uh, uh, excessive or too big. So we would expect also because of the, the big uh, take up changes, you know, some very significant uh, changes possibly in the way we remunerate renewables, which also then has, of course, a big impact on how we remunerate the others. Now, are you are looking into this, or will that be reducing your appetite uh, for renewables uh, support uh, in the future? Because also the way we remunerate all generation sources may have an impact on your rate of return on, on your projects of our infrastructure. These are obviously uh, together. Now, what I'm trying to get at is I think we will in the future have different a market design in power where different electricity sources are differently uh, remunerated. So how does that fit into, according to your view, on the infrastructure? You actually raise very important points, and, and I think you should uh, make one very simple statement. Uh, I think financial investors, uh, investors are not here, or any investors are not here to make and define policy. That's the job for the politicians. I would give, however, all politicians one very clear warning, and that is, uh, uh, it is not how you subsidize or how you define regulation, but it's about how you change it. Because if you change something which uh, we have used to invest into an asset on or thesis of an investment, and you fundamentally change the policy because you decide that this particular uh, sector no longer deserves that type of support, and that fundamentally undermines the security of our investment, uh, that sort of rattles the cage to the point that uh, we will not consider the entire sector credible and stable for investment. And I think that is a very important takeaway that goes back to the slide as well. And uh, that's why we are less interested in renewable energy today, because it become uh, less stable, less predictable. And I think that is what we are looking at, because we are not here to define policy. Okay. Uh, now, thanks. So, you know, that was a, 
a very, I think, adequate, uh, you know, statement in the beginning because the minister, you know, will be speaking next, so he might be willing uh, to respond to you or make a comment on this. Now, I would like uh, gradually to close down uh, this session, but before, uh, I would like to ask the panelists whether they would like to make uh, a final statement, uh, Guillaume. No, everything is, is set. Okay. No, just L looking forward to uh, really seeing the, uh, the implementation of the BCI. I mean, that's, uh, I think that th th there is clearly a long list of projects. Let let's, uh, let's all work together to, to deliver those projects because there's a clear need. So. No, I could then make uh, maybe a suggestion for, the, for one of the incoming presidencies. You know, next time we're discussing this, we have a longer less a session and we look at some of the lessons. And not just the success stories, you know. The failures, of course, is always the more interesting one, but I doubt that we get ma many lessons there. Uh, Alberto, you wanted to make an announcement, well, I, mean, I understood. Well, yeah, I mean, because um, I think Jiri has mentioned, you know, the fact that we're going into a sector that may look different from what we <coughs> used to. Uh, as regulators, we are now launching an initiative. Uh, we already discussed it with the Commission uh, to look at regulation and regulatory challenges beyond 2014 towards 2020, 25. You know, what should the uh, market design and regulation look like in a, in a system which has a high, much higher penetration of renewables, et cetera? And tomorrow morning in Brussels, we'll start this process by uh, so sort of launching a couple of documents, uh, one for gas, one for electricity. So you have, if you don't have anything better to do tomorrow morning at half past nine, um, we have an event. We hold an event um, in in Brussels to to launch this process, and then, well, it, this will become then um, public publicly available the documents, and we will run a, a formal consultation early in the new year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alberto. So those who are uh, on the plane with us uh, to Brussels, <laughs> know what to do uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, so I'll finish here the discussions, but first of all, thank the audience for the active uh, participation, but also for staying with us after uh, one and a half long days, but I think uh, very exciting days. I would also like to thank uh, all the, the panelists uh, for their contribution, sticking to their time, I, and making, I think, this a, quite an interesting uh, discussion uh, at this late hour. And now I would like to, to announce, or to not really to give the floor since I'm not the host, but to announce that the, the closing remarks will be made uh, by the Minister uh, for Energy of the Republic of uh, Lithuania, uh, Jaroslav Sneverovic. So here he seems to be uh, coming. So let's just welcome all the ministers. First of all, first of all, let me thank you very much, all the panelists, not only of the last panel, but also the previous ones, and also the moderators who did a really good job. So thank you very much for your help here. I also appreciate. Yes, please. I also, of course, appreciate the participation in this conference. Uh, you made this event special. Thank you very much for your input from the audience as well. Uh, well, before I try to summarize the, the presentations and discussion, let me bring up some very interesting numbers which we hear, hear, hear during the conference. Uh, and, and they are, for example, such that around 100 bottlenecks in electricity sector alone that uh, we have right now in, in the European Union. We have uh, more than 1 trillion euros investments needed in the whole EU energy sector. 200 billion euros investment needed only in transmission. We still have uh, existing energy islands. Two thirds of long term contracts will expire in the coming decade in Europe. Two or three times higher energy prices in Europe compared to the United States. So th this is not a very positive uh, picture which we have. It's quite challenging. But on the other hand, we had a very good message during our conference uh, today. And that is that we have uh, in instruments in, in hand right now. And these are 248 projects of common interest uh, who, which are dedicated to solve these challenges. We have uh, 5.8 billion euros for financing of such infrastructure. 
And uh, after mentioning these numbers, let me try to summarize also the discussion. We have, of course, discussed what already was achieved, what are the challenges ahead, and what the solutions can we have in our work towards common, completed internal energy market. We said that PCI projects will have a direct impact on creating regional energy markets. This is where it is, where it all begins. We said that smooth implementation of the projects is directly related to financing. Uh, there is a Connecting Europe facility established, but there is a still need for significant effort from stakeholders in order to ensure CEF financing effectively. We also know that CEF has a limited uh, capacities, uh, and we heard also appeal for CEF uh, instrument uh, to be flexible. Uh, we also heard uh, that uh, regional cooperation is, is crucial, especially in policy formation, and by implementing PCIs, there will be a strong interaction between the different member states' system. We also heard that uh, we should not forget about the electricity generation question when speaking about infrastructure. There was mentioned that uh, there is a time to abolish uh, national obstacles uh, in energy integration, and that is, uh, uh, first of all, having in mind the implementation of third energy package to achieve a fully functioning energy market as without doing so, it's impossible to, to integrate. We also heard uh, several times uh, mentioning of uh, gas prices decoupling from oil indexation system, uh, which is necessary. We also heard that uh, the uh, market is moving in, the, in such direction that uh, we'll probably have world global gas market in the future. And it seems like we are moving uh, into the customer market in gas. We also heard uh, Prime Minister Buzek's remarks that uh, European Parliament support for energy infrastructure is united. About 90% of members of European Parliament support trans-European energy infrastructure. However, we should not forget that uh, for projects to be implemented, we need to have 100% of public acceptance. And without such public acceptance, the projects won't be possible to implement. In the Council conclusions in 2011 and 2013, we had uh, words, very nice words, about the EU internal energy market. And now we have to move to a second stage, which is putting these words into action. We have the tools, we have PCIs, Connecting Europe facility, accelerated procedures for permit granting. So the question remains for the future how successfully we will use these instruments. And the Lithuanian presidency will be committed for a very swift and smooth approval of PCI's list in the Council. And we also hope that the same approach will be applied in the European Parliament. We treat this conference as a start of a public debate as well. I think uh, this is uh, for, for the reason that we had uh, a live streaming to the Internet to have for our public the possibility uh, for the first time in more detail to hear about the projects and that we start early on from today communicating about the projects which are on the list and that they will have a very special attention from all the member states when they're being implemented. So this is very important in our point of view. So the next steps is of course implementation, implementation, implementation. Last but not least, we have heard the calls, a very right ones, that we should also look beyond our immediate borders. Uh, we should, uh, shouldn't forget about our partners in energy community. We should look for cooperation with them in infrastructure, uh, for, for cooperation which should, could bring benefits for consumers for security of supply. And today, of course, we are celebrating the launch of a PCI list, but the real celebration will be held when we have the PCIs implemented. So finally, let me ask you to join me in uh, thanking the people who also made this conference po possible. Uh, the team from Gintotas and Thomas from Ministry of Energy, they were working very hard for this conference. So I hope you join me in thanking all the team who made this possible.